Hello everyone, this is Benjamin Fontanellis, and this is your digested version of the 2019 New York State BLS Protocols Summary of Changes. Well, the wait is finally over and our new protocols are finally here. We had a sneak peek as to what to expect when the collaborative paramedic protocols came out a number of years ago, but we really weren't sure what was going to happen. Well, now we know, here they are, and they're pretty good. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm the Director of Education for the Irvington Back EMS Training Center. In this presentation, I've taken it upon myself to pick out some of the important changes that I noticed in the new protocols. And I'm going to break it down for you, try to make it a little easier to understand as we move forward. So without further ado, let's get right into it. All right, so let's start with the basics here. First of all, our new protocols were made available to us August 1st of this year. The New York State Department of Health provided an online update for the protocols in September. And I want to really give a big shout out to Ryan Greenberg, Gene Taylor, and John McMillan for all of the work they put into that online update. This digested version is not meant to replace it. It cannot replace it. Everyone still needs to go on to the New York State Department of Health's website and to the Vital Signs Academy, which was uh, released in the instructions for these new protocols, and go through the online update through the Department of Health. That's a given. You got to do it. So definitely do that. So we all got to do that. There's also some new skills and procedures that are included in these protocols. So it's now the responsibility of the agencies in New York State, the training coordinators, so to speak, um, to, to really get their members updated on these new skills and procedures that are contained in the protocols. So all of that needs to be done no later than December 31st of this year. And as an agency gets through all of it, they can begin implementing these protocols right away. The format for these protocols is one thing that is certainly new if you're not used to it. For the paramedic population out there, this new format, we've been using it since the collaborative protocols came out. But for the BLS providers who maybe didn't see the format when the collaborative paramedic protocols came out, this is all new. It's a format that really does make things relatively easy. You'll notice there's a number of stop lines that are here, which tell the provider and the specific level where to stop and, and where they can continue. So for example, you can see here that there's information with respect to the CFR and of course anyone certified above that level, but then there's a stop line for that CFR. And then the protocols continue, allowing the higher trained individual, the EMT or above, to continue providing care. And you'll also notice there are some medical control considerations and even some key points and considerations. All stuff in these protocols that is valuable and worth reading. So you have to take the time to read all of this information. Now the summary of changes, uh, change in general is what scares people. And I'll tell you, the changes are pretty good. They're, they're, they're changes that are for the better. And I'm hoping that after you guys listen to the New York State Department of Health's presentation, and then even after listening to the, the digested version that I'm putting out, you will think the changes that are here are, are all positives. So let's not fear the changes, but let's dive right into the changes and break it all down. All right, so the first change that I wanted to discuss was the, the pediatric definition. So in our previous protocols, there really was no specific um, definition for pediatrics that was in the actual in, in the old protocol. So in our new protocols, it defines a pediatric patient as anyone who has not reached their 15th birthday. But one thing to consider is the whole clinical judgment aspect of it. Kids are going to vary in sizes. So you have to use your clinical judgment 
as a clinician, as a practitioner, to kind of decide what is reasonable and what isn't with respect to fitting a, a person in a pediatric protocol versus an adult protocol. So you have a 15-year-old withdrawn, a 14-year-old who is a very large 14-year-old, you have to decide whether it's going to be appropriate to treat that very large 14-year-old as a pediatric patient utilizing the pediatric protocol versus treating that 14-year-old who is a very large 14-year-old as an adult and utilizing the adult protocol. This is going to fall on you with respect to clinical judgment, but at least there is something in our new protocols as far as the, the perspective of the state, which clarifies that a pediatric patient is someone who has not reached their 15th birthday as of yet. The next very important protocol is the protocol that discusses restraining devices. Now, for anyone who's been doing this job for a long time, I mean, I know personally, I came into this field uh, many years ago, over 20 years ago, when it was common practice to have parents hold their small children on the stretcher for transport to the hospital. I'm not proud of it, but it wasn't something that was uncommon. Well, it was a very foolish way of transporting people. So our new protocols are very clear on what should be considered common sense. And, and common sense is this. Kids need to be restrained in the appropriate device for transport, whether it be the stretcher, whether it be a, an appropriate child seat, but they need to be put in something other than their parents' lap. So there is absolutely no reason for a child, there's no acceptable excuse for a child to be transported in their parents' lap for transport to the hospital in the back of an ambulance. So if your agency has not invested in a, a child seat that could be used for multiple kids, then your agency needs to consider doing that. If you have a child and they're if their parents have their, their, their seat and that seat is easily accessible and can easily be clipped into your ambulance, then by all means use it. If you have a child that's been in a motor vehicle accident and they're still properly restrained in their child seat and you can keep them in that seat for transport, meaning taking the seat out of the motor vehicle that was in the accident and moving it into your ambulance, by all means do it. But do not allow those children to be transported on their parents' lap. This should be common sense. As far as us as adults and practitioners, we shouldn't be moving around the back of an ambulance while it's in motion. There are plenty of variations in CPR devices out there, compression devices such as the Lucas, so on and so forth, that make it so that we don't have to stand up and do CPR in the back of moving ambulance. We should all be restrained ambulances get into accidents and when that happens the folks in the back get hurt if they're not restrained there's a possibility they could die so the common sense factor is that everyone needs to be properly restrained during transport let's talk about the new cardiac arrest protocol and and what i found in here that is that is important so you'll notice in here it says after 20 minutes, consider calling medical control for termination of resuscitation, continuing efforts, or transportation in extenuating circumstances. So this is kind of giving us the option now, as an EMT granted, it has to be the EMT level or above, to contact medical control to terminate resuscitation after we have already began resuscitation. So this is a whole new perspective for us as EMT basics out there. The paramedics have had the authority to terminate resuscitation meeting certain criteria for a while now, but that has really never been a consideration for the EMT basics. So let's put this into perspective. This is only applicable in a situation where there is no obvious hope for return of spontaneous circulation. So if you're actively performing CPR on somebody and your AED is continuing to want to deliver shocks as appropriate and you're continuing to deliver those shocks as appropriate, 
that would not be a situation where you would want to contact medical control and consider termination because the fact that the AED is still continuing to want to deliver shocks means that it is detecting something that it thinks is either ventricular fibrillation or pulsus ventricular tachycardia and it's doing its job by delivering a counter shock. So we're not going to terminate a cardiac arrest in that situation. A, a situation that might be applicable would be a situation where for 20 minutes the machine has not detected anything that it wants to shock and we can then have reason to believe the patient's in either a systole or possibly a PEA. But the bottom line is that after 20 minutes, depending on the circumstances surrounding the arrest and, and anything that's happened to date, could you call medical control and ask to terminate? Yes, you could. Um, will that happen? Who knows? Most of us will find that 20 minutes goes pretty quickly. And if we're doing things diligently, we're probably going to be in the back of the ambulance by then and continuing to transport. In fact, in most of the agencies around here, if it's a cardiac arrest, chances are you're going to have a paramedic show up on scene anyway. But the fact that we have this option now certainly is something that we're not used to at the basic life support level. So if you feel it's appropriate, if you feel you have expended at least 20 minutes involved in a cardiac arrest with no evidence to suggest there's going to be a return of spontaneous circulation, no movement from that AED such as counter shocks, then you might want to consider calling medical control and get their opinion on what's going on and what you should do next. All right, let's talk about the bleeding and hemorrhage control protocol. A couple of interesting things that I've noticed in here now that were not in previous protocols discussing bleeding. So one thing I noticed, it says that um, obviously you can utilize a hemostatic agent right away. You can use that hemostatic gauze right away with your initial direct pressure. But let's say initially that hemostatic gauze, that quick clot or whatever brand you're using is not available and you apply regular old direct pressure and the blood is typically soaking through the dressing and we know based on our training that we're never supposed to remove a dressing we're supposed to add to that dressing and continue to add to that dressing obviously the simple physiology is that if any clotting has developed at all and you peel off that dressing there's a chance you're going to take the clot with it and then you're going to have bleeding resume the same way it was initially all right so that's the understanding in our new protocol though it clearly reads that if a hemostatic dressing becomes available, you're expected to remove all conventional dressings, expose the site of bleeding, and apply the hemostatic dressing. So that's simply telling you if you've got an uncontrolled bleed somewhere in the body, something obviously other than what would be appropriate for a tourniquet, but and it's not stopping with conventional pressure dressing, that if a quick clot becomes available, some sort of hemostatic agent becomes available, you could actually remove all of those dressings, go against everything you were taught in EMT school, take all of the dressings off and apply a quick clot right to it or apply a hemostatic agent right to it and immediately get the benefits of that hemostatic agent. It totally makes sense. It's a sensible way of approaching it. It takes the robot out of the equation because yes, although we teach you never take that dressing off, this is a situation where it would be beneficial to the patient. So that certainly is a good change. One other change that I noticed is, in general, we always teach you folks at the EMT level, do not take off your tourniquets. You put a tourniquet on, it stays on, and you bring them to the hospital. So you'll notice here in the key points consideration section, it says, do not remove the tourniquet that was placed for life-threatening bleeding. However, if a tourniquet had been placed for apparently non-life-threatening bleeding, the tourniquet may be released while maintaining the ability to immediately reapply and otherwise control the hemorrhage should significant bleeding occur. So it's telling us that if for whatever reason a tourniquet was applied for something that's not life-threatening, and I'm not saying that that's appropriate, but it does happen, you know, we live in a day and age where having tourniquets and hemostatic dressings is fact. It is common practice. And so there's going to be times where maybe a tourniquet goes on by a provider such as a CFR, someone who was less trained in the EMT. Maybe they didn't recognize that it, maybe it wasn't needed. And you get there and, and, and you realize it's not a, a life-threatening bleed. You now have the option to remove that tourniquet assuming you certainly can reapply it if necessary and you're, control, you're prepared to deal with what's going to happen when you take it off. So that's something that we haven't seen before, the ability to remove or release the tourniquet 
uh, for non-life-threatening bleeding. So I thought that was a pretty uh, interesting change in the bleeding control protocol. All right, the next one is going to be the advanced directives, the DNR, and the MOLS protocol. So one thing that I noticed in here, which is pretty cool now, is the addition of the EMOLST form. So we know what MOLST stands for, Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. It's the, the traditionally hot pink form that has a significant amount of information and options for the patient to choose to determine what the care is going to be administered to them in the event where they can't make those decisions themselves. We know that DNR is specifically do not resuscitate, but the MOLST form kind of gives a lot more options for that patient. Well, now there's the eMOLST form, the electronic version of the MOLST form. So these folks can go online now and fill out all of the information they normally would do on the hot pink MOLST form, and they can do it online so that it is accessible by caregivers and family members for us to see on a computer electronically. And yes, we do have to then acknowledge it. So this is pretty cool. And, and this is kind of what the website looks like there. They go on there, there's a whole battery of information and options that they can choose from. And as long as there's electronic availability where they are, their caregiver or, or their family member can go there. And, and if we see that, we are expected to certainly uh, acknowledge and, and uh, respect what is in that electronic most form. So that's a pretty cool change there, the ability to have electronic most forms. Also, don't forget that not only do we acknowledge uh, the, the written DNR document, there are, although not often seen, but there are DNR bracelets and or necklaces that if they are uh, affixed to the patient, we should acknowledge them as well. The next one I want to talk about is the obvious death protocol. In our previous protocols, there was no specific protocol that discussed what is considered obvious death. So the things that are listed here, uh, such as body decomposition, rigor mortis, dependent lividity, injury not compatible with life, such as decapitation, burn beyond recognition, so on and so forth, that's all stuff that hopefully you were taught in basic EMT school as, as things that we just were not going to attempt resuscitation with. There are things that just, this is not, those are not candidates for resuscitation. One thing that I noticed that's in here now, though, which is pretty interesting, is, is that the patient who has been submerged for greater than one hour in any water temperature. So that's something that I haven't seen in the protocols before, specifically because we didn't have an obvious death protocol in the last version of the protocols from New York State. But nonetheless, um, that addition there um, is, is something that is pretty neat. The patient who has been submerged for greater than one hour in any water temperature, so that is also what would be considered obvious death. So a drowning, for example, where someone who's been in the pool or been in a body of water for an extended period of time for one hour or greater than one hour, that is definitely going to be considered obvious death, meaning we do not initiate resuscitation. Also understand that if you come across any of these situations uh, where resuscitation has been initiated by someone else, a nurse, a nurse, another healthcare practitioner, and you come to the situation and you see that there is evidence that this meets the obvious death protocol, you can immediately stop the resuscitation. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. All right, so this protocol is, is kind of interesting. This is the, uh, the pediatric protocol that deals with something that most of us as practitioners have seen before. The parent or the caregiver witnesses something, witnesses something that they believe is either life-threatening or, or really scary for them. And you know we hear it dispatched as something that sounds pretty significant, baby not breathing, child not breathing, child turning blue, and then we get there. And the whole thing is fine now. The kid looks just like they should look and we're sitting there scratching our heads thinking, well, what did this person see or what happened? And, you know, sometimes there is explainable situations such as baby was feeding and suddenly they got clogged as they were feeding. They, they coughed, they went in their nose and made it difficult for them to breathe for a moment. Or even the typical febrile seizure, which is always scary for the parents. But... The purpose of this protocol 
is to address these situations in children less than two and recognize that there is going to be situations where it is worth, absolutely worth getting them transported. Even if, if once you get there, it's resolved and the parents are like, you know, we don't need to go to the hospital. You should probably suggest that they do because this protocol is meant to allow us to recognize potentially significant underlying reasons that whatever it was that happened and that caregiver witnessed, um, and it's unexplained, but it needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed. The patient needs to be assessed at the hospital, and there needs to be that, that ability to recognize something underlying that might be significant. So probably a good idea to try to make sure you get that patient or that parent to allow that patient to be transported to the hospital. All right, the difficulty breathing and the asthma wheezing protocol. So this is a pretty cool protocol here. And, uh, you know, some of the stuff that you see here is kind of similar to the way it was written before, but there is some significant changes here. So this protocol applies to anybody who's having difficulty breathing with wheezing, and, and, and we have to exclude the traumatic causes in the pneumothorax patients. So these are the people who are having trouble breathing. They're, they're exhibiting signs of wheezing, whether it's inspiratory or expiratory. And so for, for us as EMTs out there, we're going to still give the albuterol like we have done in the past, but I'll get into the drug changes later on. But there's a lot more uh, leniency now in, in giving this albuterol than there has been in the past. Uh, some of the restrictions have been removed. So now we're giving this albuterol for the presence of wheezing in respiratory distress, assuming it's not traumatic or related to a pneumothorax, period. That's it. We also now, assuming your agency is approved to do so and granted this is at the discretion of your agency, is not required, but CPAP. And with the CPAP that's out there nowadays, there is CPAPs that are, allow you to not only give CPAP, but also allow you to administer albuterol at the same time with the CPAP, which is wonderful for the patients who will benefit from it. Notice in here that the big thing that we were waiting for was the ability to give epinephrine for a critical asthma attack. This doesn't mean that every time we get an asthma patient, we automatically break out the IM epinephrine and, and we're ready to dart them. It's not likely that you'll have to give epinephrine for the asthmatic patient. Most asthmatics that we deal with in the field respond relatively well to the albuterol, number one. Number two, in most cases, there will probably be a paramedic who's going to be there and probably do some other things in addition to giving albuterol. But if the event does arise where you as the EMT basic are there, you don't have ALS support, and you have an asthma patient that is resistant to albuterol, they are not responding well to albuterol, and you notice that they're getting progressively worse, you're 100% you're sure that what you're dealing with here is, is wheezing related to asthma, you can now call medical control and get permission to give epinephrine, IM, whether it be through auto-injector or whether it be through uh, the check and inject method. But nonetheless, epinephrine, IM, for this critical asthma patient. Please understand, this is not a standing order. This is a medical control option only, but it is one that we have not had in the past, the ability to give epinephrine for a critical asthma attack. So that's a pretty neat change in the in the difficulty breathing asthma protocol. All right, so this protocol here, the opioid narcotic overdose protocol, well, we didn't have a specific opioid narcotic overdose protocol in our last version of the protocols. They were, it was uh, kind of woven into the altered mental status protocol, but considering all of the cases that exist now that EMTs respond to and first responders in general, uh, dealing with opiate overdose, it seems only appropriate to have a dedicated opiate slash narcotic protocol. So this protocol is pretty well written. One thing it does clarify here is when it's appropriate to use Narcan. Uh, not every opiate overdose requires the use of Narcan. Now, opiate overdose is where the patient is breathing adequately enough to sustain life does not require the use of Narcan. These, or the use of Narcan is specifically for patients who have a suspected opioid overdose or opioid overdose, and they are not breathing 
enough to sustain life. Hypoventilation, slow, shallow, ineffective respirations, because that's what ultimately will kill the opiate overdose patient. So you have to recognize when they're not breathing enough to sustain life, they're not breathing adequately enough, hypoventilation, and yes, then it is totally appropriate for you to give that Narcan. And the example when it would be inappropriate would be the patient who's looking at you saying that they overdosed on, on, on heroin or they overdosed on an opiate. So if they're able to communicate with you, if they're able to speak, if they are breathing well enough to sustain life, then they are not a candidate for Narcan. So please understand. And currently, yes, we are using both versions of the Narcan out there, the typical uh, two milligram atomizer that we have. And of course, the the newer version, which I believe has uh, four milligrams in a, a considerably smaller solution that you can give all in one nostril one time. So obviously, depending on what you use will depend on how you administer it. All right, this is a protocol that definitely was not in the previous protocols, the, the sepsis slash septic shock protocol. So recognizing sepsis in the field is something that is important for us as EMTs. And, and granted, not it's not always going to be easy to recognize, but there are some criteria that you should be looking for. So if you get that patient, and here are some of the criteria here that you, you believe they're suffering from some sort of an infection. Infection, and then you add in the, the hypotension, the, the low blood pressure, less than 90 millimeters of mercury or altered mental status, and then a heart rate that's elevated, a respiratory rate that's possibly elevated. If, if your agency carries a thermometer, if the patient has a temperature of greater than 100.4, as far as the white blood count, you're not going to know that information unless you're taking a patient from a facility and that facility provides you paperwork to suggest that the white blood count is either significantly elevated, significantly lowered, or there's, there's bands, which bands suggest that there is a, an onset of an infection. And that's why those new white blood cells are being produced. So nonetheless, if you suspect that you're dealing with a patient who's suffering from sepsis or septic shock, the important thing is certainly to manage them, but notify the hospital that you believe you're coming in with a patient who is either septic or suffering from septic shock. Um, so that's the, the take home message here is to recognize it and make sure you notify the hospital that that's what you're dealing with. All right, so the technology assisted children and this is something that's been long overdue. Uh, we, we certainly teach this in the EMT program, uh, how to deal with, with tech kids. But now having a protocol that actually kind of spells it out does make it a little easier. And, and when you go to some of these, uh, these, these long-term care facilities, you might encounter some of these children that have these, these, uh, these technology needs, so to speak, the tracheostomy is the the central venous catheters, a CV, uh, the CSF shunts. So it's not expected that you're going to know how to manage all of these devices. That's not the point here. The point here is to recognize that what they are and that if they are there, you might need to assist in the management of these kids, assist with these devices. So there's usually going to be a, a caretaker or a practitioner on scene who is familiar with dealing with these devices. Um, but if you're asked to assist, or at least you should have an understanding of what each of these devices do, that would be beneficial. And, and, and that's what we're teaching in EMT school is, is, is to recognize the device, these devices and to have an understanding of how exactly it is that they work. So, the basics for dealing with the tech kids, and I'll tell you the one thing that, that, you know, if you can figure out how to use some of this stuff, it's very important, such as if you got a trait kid and the ventilator's not working, it's really simple. You take them off the trach and you bag them. So that's something you can certainly do. Um, is with respect to the central venous catheters, if there's a clamp on it, you can certainly clamp or pinch it off. If there's a gas, a G tube, we call it a gastronomy tube or button. And if the tube is dislodged, you can cover the site. If there's a Foley catheter dislodged, tape it in place. But the majority of the time when you deal with these patients, there's going to be some sort of a, 
an aide or a family member who's familiar with these devices and they're going to be able to kind of assist you with it. All right, so now let's talk about this one. This is pretty cool. The total artificial heart patient. So this is a patient where everything else has failed and, and they are officially out of time. They have a, a heart that is failing. They might be on the transplant list, but the bottom line is that they are officially out of time. So with respect to the total artificial heart, it's, it's a, a device that is implanted or surgically implanted in place of the, the most functional part of the heart, the ventricles, and it's, it's surgically implanted there and it acts as the heart. It's meant to be a temporary fix while, so to allow that person more time to remain on the transplant list and possibly get a, a complete heart transplant. So as, as you can see in this picture, this is a, a pneumatic device. So it's air powered and, and it, the air power is through those drive lines that you see, which go to the, the battery pack um, that's usually carried in a backpack or a satchel or something like that. So there's no blood flowing through those drive lines. It's a pneumatic device. It's, it's air that's flowing through those drive lines. But a couple of things to consider. If you're dealing with a patient who is an extremist who is in distress and they have a total artificial heart think about the device there's a couple of things you can check if there's no pulse present um, check for kinks in those drive lines if the if there's a hand pump available you can actually because remember it's a pneumatic device so a hand pump is the equivalent of a, a battery powered version of air being produced you're hand pumping air into the device and you're actually going to pump blood for that patient do not perform CPR on this patient. Remember CPR when you're doing compressions is to mechanically or manually squeeze the heart, to force blood out of it. There's no heart here. This is a mechanical device. Therefore, um, doing CPR would be completely unnecessary and ineffective. So do not do CPR. If you have a patient that has a total artificial heart like this, um, make sure that you contact the facility you're considering transporting that patient to to make sure that they are capable of dealing with the total artificial heart. Make sure you let them know what it is you're dealing with, the total artificial heart. Another really cool device is a VAD or an LVAD. And it's either a ventricular assist device or sometimes often known as a left ventricular assist device. And this is for a patient who once again has a, a pretty much a failing heart, but um, this method of management can be for either short term or long term, especially if you get a patient who is of a certain age and they have effectively aged out of the, the criteria to be a recipient for a heart transplant. This device, when you put a VAD in place, um, it gives them more time, a, a long, a longer time, so to speak. It gives them more time, especially when they're now not a candidate anymore for a heart transplant. So the VAD or the LVAD, depending on what it is you're dealing with, kind of looks like this. It's surgically implanted and it assists in pumping blood directly out of the left ventricle and then right into the aorta. So it's assisting in moving that blood out through either a constant pump or a demand pump um, but the things to consider with this device is the fact that you might not have a pulse. So this patient might normally not have a pulse. In a continuous flow VAD, the absence of a palpable pulse is completely normal. In a pulsatile flow VAD, um, they might have a pulse. And in fact, they might even have a heart rate, although very low. So you might not know what device you're dealing with. But the fact is you should be listening to see if the thing is working. There should be a, possibly a sound that goes with it. And if you auscultate it, you might actually hear the hum. So if you use your stethoscope, you can possibly hear the hum of this device. And really, the heart's still in place. So CPR is not off the table. But the fact is that CPR should only be done as a last resort when there are no signs of this device working, meaning no motor hum. So yes, there's still a heart in place. 
Yes, you could still do CPR on this patient, but the idea is that the device should be doing the work instead of you doing CPR. So if there is still a hum, if the motor is still functioning, then no, we're not gonna do CPR on this patient. But if there's evidence to suggest there's no hum, the device is completely not working, then yes, you could consider doing CPR on this patient. All right, so this is a really cool protocol that's here for the BLS providers now, and this is the Avols Tooth Protocol. I will say in, the, in the, my entirety of my career, I've never dealt with an Avols Tooth, but I do feel pretty good knowing that this protocol is here now, just in case I ever happen to deal with an Avols Tooth. So if you get an Avols Tooth, and we're talking about real teeth, permanent teeth only, and the, and the tooth completely comes out, couple of things you need to consider. Is it intact? And, and when you're holding this tooth, you're going to hold it by the crown of the tooth. Let me see if I got a picture up here. Here it is. So this is the anatomy of the tooth. And you notice that the, the root is down below, the crown is up top, and you're going to hold it by the crown. And if the root is still intact, you can consider um, re-implanting this tooth where it came out of. Granted, the root needs to be in crack, uh, intact. If the root is cracked, then we're not going to re-implant this tooth. But if you get a tooth that comes out whole and the root's completely intact, you can consider re-implanting this tooth. So you're, you're going to want to wash it off with a little saline. And by washing it off, I mean running saline over it. Do not wipe it down. And then you're going to need to take your suction device and go up where the socket is and suck out the clot that's hopefully developed there by now, obviously. Otherwise, the person would be bleeding. And once you have sucked out that clot and you've uh, dial, uh, rinsed off the, the tooth and, and the saline, you can digitally, meaning with your fingers, reimplant that tooth, then give the patient a gauze to bite down on because that is truly the best place to transport an avulsed tooth is back in the socket. So if for any reason the root is broken or the patient is altered and not able to follow those instructions as far as biting down on the gauze pad, then, then certainly don't try to re-implant the tooth. So I got some really cool videos here. And you can see in this situation, this is a, a, a child and, and the practitioner here has already gone through the motions of, of rinsing the tooth off. And now he's simply putting it back up into the socket, pressing it on up there, and that's where it's gonna stay. And following that, that the, the provider would obviously give the patient, the child, the gauze to bite down on. Here's another video, real quick one, of a tooth being re-implanted. Very easy procedure, pushing it up there, and then you give the, the patient the gauze to bite down on for the duration of transport. All right, the next protocol is gonna be our patella dislocation protocol. Really cool protocol for those situations where the kneecap dislo dislocates either medially or laterally. So in this protocol, we're given the authority now to reduce those knee dislocations, those medial or lateral knee dislocations. And the procedure itself is relatively simple. The only thing you have to consider is the amount of pain that the patient's in and whether it's going to be something you can facilitate without pain management. Certainly, you know, at the EMT basic level, you don't have the ability to give pain management, the paramedics do. But nonetheless, if this is a situation where it's going to be reasonable to do so, meaning the patient is not screaming in excruciating pain because we're not, our job is not to torture people then this is a procedure that should be relatively straightforward and easy to do. So let's take a look at a video here. Um, the real simple procedure, this guy pretty much did it with one hand, but nonetheless, he's got to move it just a little bit more. So you got two providers involved here. You're straightening the leg out and you're, you're basically popping that kneecap or sliding that kneecap back to midline where it belongs. It's not a hard thing to do, but you got to straighten the leg out progressively so you can clear and get that kneecap in. Let me see, there should be another video here for you folks. Here's another one. So you see the kneecap is, is dislocated laterally. 
So you got the practitioner here. And he's preparing to, to move that kneecap back to where it needs to be, back to its anatomical position. He's going to straighten the knee out. And boom, puts the kneecap right back to where it belongs. When you're doing this procedure, it is important to make sure that after you're done, you got to splint it because you don't know if there was any kind of ligament damage um, during the actual dislocation. Because remember, the, the, the kneecap dislocation typically happens due to severe hyperextension of the leg. So there could be some sort of ligament damage, you don't know. And when you get that kneecap back into place, assuming you're able to do so, you really want to make sure you splint the leg. This provider right here is going to do it by himself. Done, just like that, real simple, real easy. But please, be reminded, obviously, if your patient is screaming in excruciating pain, you might want to consider pain management first, which means that obviously you would need a paramedic there to facilitate the administration of some sort of pain management. All right, let's get into the prescribed medication assistance protocol. So this protocol, pretty much what's contained in it is nothing really new. So we've always been able to assist patients in the administration of their nitroglycerin. We've been able to assist them with their albuterol inhaler, their epinephrine auto injector. Um, the one thing that stands out here that is definitely new is rectal diazepam, which is rectal Valium. And it's a benzodiazepam that's often given to deal with seizures. So Although you folks as EMT basics are not going to be carrying narcotics, you're not going to be carrying rectal valium or diazepam. So you might be put in a situation where you have a, a parent or a caregiver who's going to need to administer this medication rectally and they might ask for your assistance. We're not expecting you to be able to, to, to field this one on your own by yourself. We're expecting you to be able to work with the parent or the caregiver to facilitate the administration following their instruction with their direction, not doing this solo, but purely assisting the patient, not uh, withdrawing the parent or the caregiver in the administration of the rectal diazepam. Now, if you'll notice here in the back of the protocol, new protocols, there's a variety of resources that are here. These resources are definitely worth a read. And one thing that I will mention contained in the resources is the section for automatic transport ventilator. So that's not a protocol. It's a, it's a set of general guidelines to dealing with automatic transport ventilators. And the reason it can't be a protocol is that there's just a simply too many brands and variations of automatic transport ventilators out there. So if you end up working for an agency that does use automatic transport ventilators, it's going to be the responsibility of the agency to get you in serviced on the model, the brand that they're using, so that you're familiar with it. We do talk about and teach um, automatic transport ventilators in the EMT school, the general guidelines on how to use them, but as far as the specific one that your agency will end up using, if they do use one, they'll have to in-service you on that. All right, let's get into some of the pharmacology changes um, here in the new protocols. So the first one's going to be epinephrine. And if you remember in the past with epinephrine dealing with anaphylactic reactions, the patient had to, be, had to have been previously prescribed an EpiPen in order to administer the EpiPen in the field. Otherwise, you had to call for medical control um, authority first. So that's done. Uh, now, basically, what you have to have is a patient who's in severe respiratory distress with facial or oral edema and hypoperfusion. So they have to have the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock, and you can administer that EpiPen or the check and inject version of epinephrine with alkaline for medical control, even if the patient's never been prescribed an EpiPen in the past. That's a given. So in addition to that, let's say you have a patient who has a a, a known sensitivity to something, he knows what their allergen is, and they know that they're going to have an anaphylactic reaction if exposed to that allergen. We'll use the example of it being a bee. And the patient tells you, I just got stung by a bee. I know that I'm going to have an anaphylactic reaction to it. You can then go and administer the epinephrine IM, even though they're not technically anaphylactic yet. 
but they know that they have a specific allergen. They know they were exposed to it, and they know the result of that's going to be anaphylaxis. They provide you with that information. You can then go ahead and give the Epi IM. Activated charcoal, no longer in the protocol. It's gone. It used to be in our poisoning section of the protocol, even though it was never a standing order. It was always a medical control option, but it is no longer there. It is gone. Narcan we touched upon in the opiate portion of our little presentation here. And just a reminder with the uh, Narcan administrations only for suspected opiate overdoses where the patient is hypoventilating. They are not breathing adequately enough to sustain life. Ineffective respirations. That's when we give the Narcan. Oral glucose now has a tangible dose suggestion. So the suggestion is 15 to 24 grams, where in the past it just said give a tube of oral glucose. Is it really a big deal one way or another? Not really, because if we have a hypoglycemic patient and there's no contraindications, meaning they can effectively swallow and understand, we're going to give them the whole tube regardless, or we're going to give them some other sugar-containing substance by mouth, so, but it is nice to see that actual dose suggestion in the new protocols. Aspirin. So in the past, if the patient's taken aspirin prior to our arrival, we were not ever to give any more. Now the protocols, the new ones clearly read that if there's any, uh, any concern with respect to the patient having received an effective dose of aspirin prior to your arrival, you can go ahead and give a full dose of 324 milligrams again. So, it shows that the benefits of aspirin certainly far outweigh the risks of giving an, an additional dose. So if you're not sure they got an effective dose before you got there, you go ahead and give them your 324 milligram dose. Albuterol, definitely big changes. So in the old protocols, we had to have a patient between the ages of 1 and 65 years of age suffering an exacerbation of their previously diagnosed asthma. Now we just need a patient who's in respiratory distress and is wheezing and it's not traumatic and it's not a pneumothorax. We can go ahead and give our albuterol. So we have standing orders to give three doses of albuterol. In addition, we do not need to call medical control if the patient has a history of angina, heart attack, arrhythmia, or congestive failure, which we used to have to do. That is no longer something we have to do. And finally, nitroglycerin. In our new protocols, there's no mention of a concern with respect to ED drugs. So as that being a contraindication. So uh, regardless of that, in EMT school, we're still teaching our students that it's good practice to ask, have you had any erectile dysfunction medication recently? Because we know the combination of erectile dysfunction medication and nitroglycerin could be deadly. So we're still going to ask regardless. It's still a good practice to ask, and we're still teaching our EMT students to make sure they ask that question before helping the patient take their nitroglycerin. And finally, a couple of other little changes I noticed. The CDC guidelines, the triage guidelines that used to be referred to as the adult major trauma protocol are now called the trauma patient destination protocol. So same thing, same triage guidelines. However, it just has a new title, Trauma Patient Destination. The hypoperfusion protocol is no longer there. It is gone. So with that goes mass pants. Now, granted, the majority of us have not used mass pants in probably over 20 years, but there was still a hypoperfusion protocol in the old protocols where mass was an option if you were regionally approved, trained, and available. So since that protocol is gone, there is no more mention of mass pants in the new protocols. And finally, the new chest trauma protocol, nothing too crazy. Very simple chest trauma protocol, although it wasn't in our previous protocols. Really straightforward. If there's a hole, put an occlusive dressing over it. That's about it. And that is what I found to be interesting in the new protocols. I hope what this presentation was was helpful to you. I look forward to hearing your feedback, and you're welcome to contact me anytime at my email address, criticalcaring at gmail.com. Good luck out there, and happy studying, folks. Take care.